Okay, can everyone hear me? Cool. Uh, well, thanks for uh, sticking around at the conference long enough to attend the last talk. Thanks for attending. Um, my name is John Rodriguez. I work at Square on the Cash App team. Um, we do peer-to-peer -peer, um, financial services and payments. And I'm going to be talking about effective Swift Kotlin interoperability today. Um, some context is um, if you saw Alex Strong and, and Ben Asher's talk the other day on um, how multi-platform is being used in their respective apps, you'll know that we already have um, some multi-platform usage in Cash App. And we're looking for like additional ways to continue moving that. And so as more of the team starts exploring this, like I, in this talk, I want to share my um, experiences in it so far. Um, provide some early insights from my perspective, things to be mindful of, and maybe even provide some advice. Um, but this is still a work in progress for me as well, so um, feel free to you know, draw your own conclusions on it. <clears throat> okay, so over the past year, multi-platform fever has swept the world with the promise of code sharing between the iOS and Android code bases. But how does it really work? TLDR turns out with a lot of help from Objective-C. For instance, Objective-C can be used in Kotlin if it's properly imported to this build using C interop. This means invoking the native compiler to generate bindings, which will serve as a proxy to the compiled Caleb binary. Swift can also be used in Kotlin if the corresponding Swift API is first exported to the Objective-C uh, API using the at objc compiler attribute. Now, you may be wondering how could I be talking about effective Swift Kotlin interop if no such thing exists. And the truth is, when I submitted this talk back in May, I took a bold bet that JetBrains would probably offer some pure Swift module support since a couple of months prior, Swift 5 was finally released declaring API stability, uh, ABI stability. Um, but alas, here we are with no pure Swift to, uh, support at this time. But Nevertheless, we still find great utility from Kotlin Native providing bidirectional interop with the Objective-C and Swift programming languages. However, for the rest of this talk, we're going to be talking about um, consuming Kotlin libraries in Objective-C Swift code. In this fashion, the Kotlin Native compiler will assemble a framework, which is a library artifact in iOS speak. So, First, I'm going to go through the setup um, very quickly because you probably saw this in other talks. I, I haven't really um, gauged how the other talks went through this, but I'm assuming that maybe you, um, I don't know who's Android developers, who are iOS developers, or who are backend engineers here. So, I mean, the first thing what you'll do is obviously install Android Studio and configure Android specific things like the build tools, the, the platform tools, and the runtime. Um, and then you'll create your new project. It'll just create a little Hello World uh, Android application. And then where you start to actually move into like multi-platform things is when you first create this shared code module. Um, and then in its build Gradle script, start setting up things that are um, part of the multi-platform setup. And so um, applying the plugin and then setting up your targets for their respective platforms. In this case, we're really uh, focused on the iOS target. Um, and the framework that we're using in this sample is abbreviated for the name of the talk, so Effective uh, Swift Kotlin Interop, so that's why it's SKO framework. And then we'll configure the source sets. Um, as you've seen uh, so far, we have like the common source set and the Android source set, and we'll also have a, an equivalent iOS source set, and they'll just point to their respective Kotlin standard lib implementations. The interesting part is here because now, um, as you may know, like iOS and Gradle don't necessarily, like they're, they're, that's not something that interacts uh, normally. Gradle's more of a like Android or backend domain. Um, and so to get this interoperability in your, in your, your build lifecycle, your development lifecycle, you have to create this task, which is gonna just copy the build output from Xcode, or rather um, execute as part of the Xcode build pipeline, the task that will just um, copy that um, from the um, Gradle build into a place where Xcode can then consume it and link it. Um, at this point, you'll probably need to build your app in order to generate that dynamic framework on your file system, because then you're going to pick it up in, when you do the next Xcode setting. Um, in this quick sample, you'll see that we pretty much just have a couple of um, 
actual implementations for one expect. And so this is pulled from the JetBrains tutorial that just shows how you do the multi-platform stuff. Um, in this case, we're just showing like the device, the platform name, so a very uh, platform-specific printout. And then moving on to Xcode, um, if you go to the tutorial, you know you have to first link the uh, framework in order to um, compile it as into your uh, binary and dynamically link it. Um, and so the, here we add the framework to the embedded binaries block, <clears throat> and this will help um, Xcode be able to resolve imports from Objective C and Swift. Next, we'll have to add the framework path to the framework search paths block, and then the binary executable will use that path to look for the required frameworks. Finally, we add that Gradle script to hook everything together, and at this point, it should be able to build, pack, and link the native framework. And again, there's a tutorial that goes into this in, in more detail. Um, you can always take a look at it at that link afterward. Um, but the point is to get to an initial setup. Well, after completing the lab, you'll see this screen upon launching on both clients. And the purpose of this is to create a sandbox from which the rest of this talk will start experimenting and looking at Objective-C headers and seeing what different Kotlin um, variants will, will um, actually generate. Um, so what's actually happening is you're, you're building two artifacts, right? One for your iOS client and one for your Android client. Uh, the Android client one is an APK. It's uh, pretty much a zip of all the things that an Android uh, device would need in order to bootstrap the app. And on iOS, there's an IPA file that acts as its equivalent. And so through their respective uh, build tool chains, um, they will consume via either Gradle or the Xcode build process um, uh, an AAR. Oh, I have that swapped, actually. Um, <laughs> Just testing you. Um, an IPA file should be consuming a framework um, artifact, and an APK should be consuming an AAR artifact, <clears throat> um, which may have, which would likely have some common jar dependency, and that's where like the shared Kotlin code base will come in. And this is all comprised of that shared code module that I showed you earlier. <clears throat> the way that those, the expected actual thing is 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 how the Kotlin native framework is linking. <clears throat> but the dependency management from the action consuming app to the artifacts are going to be done by, again, Xcode build or um, Gradle. And turtles all the way down. If you had third party dependencies, multi platform libraries, they would in, in turn have their own hierarchical structure. Okay, so that's like the quick and easy setup part of the talk. Now that we've set that up, let's actually start crossing the interrupt bridge. And so now if we start playing around and just start throwing some very simple like Kotlin primitives um, in the shared code module. <clears throat> What's interesting is to see what actually gets generated on the Objective-C side. Um, I tried this out first because you know, we know that with the, with the object keyword that you should basically have an, an, an implied singleton object. And I wanted to see, first of all, if this is something that's still respected in, in Objective-C. And so to do so, I then create, um, you'll notice that you, you still have to add the parentheses, unlike in Kotlin, where you don't for instantiating the object. You, you will have to in Objective-C. Um, but then I print out the memory addresses of each of those instances, and you would expect that the object instance would have a shared memory address, and the class instances would be uh, different addresses. And in fact, those are honored. Um, and so I'm curious then to know how Objective-C handles it under the hood. And so if we look at the actual output headers, um, we see a, a bunch of this. And um, first step is uh, maybe if you're not familiar with Objective-C, is just understanding what's actually going on here. And so everything starts off by inheriting from this um, Kotlin-based class. Um, the, in Java, you have object as your root class, um, your root type. Um, and for this generated Kotlin native world, Kotlin base serves as your root type. And what's important to note here is that the three methods that it defines, it deliberately takes the constructor of NS object and hides it. It makes it unavailable. That compiler directive is there for a reason. And then what will happen is that um, inherited subclasses of Kotlin base will selectively um, turn on that constructor when needed. And in fact, that's how the object um, paradigm from Kotlin translates over, as we'll see in a second. Um, another uh, interesting compiler attribute here is the objects, uh, object C requires super. Um, 
It's essentially like the at call super annotation in Java world where you're you know, basically in implementing this method, you should be calling your parent class's initialize method. Um, for those of you not familiar with Objective-C, if, you if you're prefixed with a minus, you're an instance method, and if you're prefixed with a plus, you're a static method. So that's important for the, the next thing that we're going to go over. And so now we go to the, imp the representation of that object type and that class type that I defined in the Kotlin world. And we see um, the same subclassing restricted uh, attributes. We could ignore those for now. Um, but you see that we're also supplied with another attribute called Swift name. And so in, in Objective-C headers, there's this global namespace that just gets concatenated into the name of the corresponding class. And it can get really long really quick. And so instead of instantiating your SKO off object, you can just call object from Swift code. And the bridge will handle that nicely so that the syntax is a little sweeter. Um, another thing to note is that at interface here does not imply the same thing as interfaces in Java. This is like the, the API of an actual class for which there'll be an associated at implementation in Objective-C world. Um, interfaces in Objective-C are represented using protocols. Um, and then here's the part that I wanted to call out again. Um, so here you see that on the object class, there's a static method called object. And it's alias to its Swift name as init, which is typically the constructor. And so it's not actually a constructor, but it's serving in Swift world as a constructor. And, this is, and because it's a static method, it's able to share the same instance across multiple invocations. That's how you're able to like, simulate the object uh, paradigm from Kotlin in Objective-C. And then below it, you'll see a regular old class. And it's an instance method. It's its constructor. And it just aliases to a similar name, init. OK, so let's move on to another example. Let's say we want to increment um, a variable, something simple, just to see how that generates. And in Swift world, <clears throat> we'll try to consume it in this way. Um, note that the, the um, package name, uh, or rather the framework name, <clears throat> and the class file that you created on the Kotlin side will play into the namespace that you then call the method on on the Swift consumer side. And um, what you notice right away is that you'll get, you'll get this error in the IDE. And it's like, cannot convert value into int32. And so it's like, OK, that kind of makes sense. Um, digging a little more, you realize that in Objective-C world, that int got translated into an int32 type. Um, and that, that part of the lesson there is that you know, Objective-C extends from like the C programming language from the Ricci and Kernighan days. And back then, the integer type was architecture um, specific. And so it's it, similar to like the integer type on Java, where depending if you're a 16-bit JVM or a 32-bit JVM, the bytes representing that integer could vary. Um, so does it in Objective-C. But in Kotlin native world, um, it's a little more strict on enforcing that. Kotlin.int is always a 16-bit integer, and long is always a 32-bit integer. Um, I'm assuming it's because, it's, it, because it has to um, you know, in its cross-platform nature, have to have really strict guidelines on types and can't just be as, as fluid as, say, um, Objective-C is, um, I, I guess. I don't really know. Truth be told, most iOS devices, including watch APIs, are 32-bit uh, these days. Um, uh, I'm just sorry, actually, 64-bit these days. I think uh, I meant to say 32 and 64-bit. Um, but there could be a day where it would be 128-bit. Uh, um, devices, and so this problem will continue. Um, it's just something to know about when you're interopping with the int type. And so here you go. You'll see that the, the type is there. And the way to fix that here, unfortunately, I have, didn't really figure out a better way, is just to cast it to int32, which is, isn't really satisfying. Um, on the flip side, if you were trying to consume um, the Swift or Objective-C API from the Kotlin world, there's a nice little utility function called convert that'll cast it to the appropriate uh, variant of int for you. Um, but I was unable to find uh, one that would go from uh, a Swift call site of a, call, of a Kotlin library. All right, that was supposed to be a joke about how Xcode uh, takes forever to resolve errors. <laughs> um, so what if we want to increment other numeric types? And so we provide other integral values here and do the same thing. And what will those look like in the call sites? And so 
A couple of things is, all right, the same problem that we had with int32, we now have with int64. Um, because by default, floating point numbers in Swift default to type double, you have to then explicitly define your type for float. But the, really, the thing to point out here is, look at those argument names in the overloads for plus plus. It's random underscores. Uh, what is that about? And it's because even though um, the Swift name attribute does its best to make it feel like native to Swift, there still is a backing Objective-C implementation and an Objective-C method, I don't know if they're called method signatures, the jargon's probably off there, but part of the method signature includes all the parameter names, it concatenates them. And so because I uh, chose to use the same argument name of value, um, now there's a tie. And tiebreaker apparently goes to the return value type for sorting. And so the reason why in this screen you arbitrarily see like two underscores, then three, then one, then a zero, then one, is because on the Objective-C header side, double sorts lexicographically before float, before int32, and before int64. I mean, didn't you know that? Um, so the, 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 the real thing to keep in mind is if you're going to overload your methods for bridging purposes, just use distinct argument names. Um, it's, it's kind of obvious, I guess, if you play with enough Objective-C that it tends to be a little more verbose in its typage, but here's a good reason why. It's probably trying to avoid these type of collisions uh, when generating their respective headers. Okay, so let's move on to um, a few compromises that you'll have to make in, in embracing this interop world. Um, some of them have already been uh, cited. Um, lack of common library support is asterisk here because um, you know, when you, if you tried using interop or multi-platform as of a year or a year and a half ago, you realize if you came from a Java world that we've been spoiled. We've had a long list of libraries developed for the JDK and there are open source libraries as well. You know, gzip encoders, file operations, networking APIs, DP APIs, UTF-8 encoders, things that you never thought like you needed but you were glad they were around certainly disappear. But the asterisk is because um, as Andre mentioned during the keynote, like JetBrains has been doubling down on, on this over the last year as well. I mean, obviously you're, you've probably heard this, the coroutines library. Um, they're also really um, um, working with the serialization stuff. And most recently, the daytime library is a huge value add. Um, if, if you have a requirement for shared code that hasn't been satisfied here, you'll either have to be clever and find a way to decouple it or write it yourself. Um, JetBrains is trying to uh, tackle these areas where they come up. Um, but also the cache team at Square has, has also chosen to double down on this approach because we're really, um, we really like the appeal of having a shared code base using mul uh, Kotlin multi-platform. And so we, in a sense, want to help um, build this community of libraries as well. And so um, you've, you've probably are familiar with OKHDP being the canonical web um, HTTP client on uh, JVM-based um, devices. Um, but also OKIO is like a, a, a better form of Java streams. Um, I probably should have deleted Mashi from there because that's not true. Um, and then Wire also has recently become um, multi-platform capable, which I'll talk about a little bit towards the end of the talk. Um, we also have, as Alec and Ben mentioned the other day, SQL Delight, which is multi-platform, and that solves, like, because iOS and Android happen to use uh, SQLite databases, they can easily benefit from a shared API. But that being said, SQL Delight is not necessarily tied to SQLite implementations. Um, it's a matter of just writing the appropriate driver, and then you can connect to, theoretically, a MySQL or Postgres um, database. So um, again, just another uh, tool in the toolbox. Um, another library I came across that's pretty interesting is this one by Russ Wolf called Multi-Platform Settings. He talked about it, I think, at DroidCon New York this year or the previous year. Or, yeah, one of those. Um, and uh, this is a, a wrapper around um, the key value pair storage on mobile devices known as shared preferences on Android and NS user defaults on iOS devices. So again, just people in the community providing libraries like this really just benefit everyone and will really help mass adoption of multi-platform. Another compromise is just avoid the UI layer. Um, we, there were attempts in the past to do things like React Native and Ionic, and we've learned lessons that it's just really hard to build this common UI either. It doesn't look right or it doesn't provide the feature set that you require. Um, I, I tend to think that any entertainment of these type of libraries pretty much died with the Airbnb blog um, because 
uh, Gabriel Peel is a pretty well-respected person in the community, and he wrote this multi-series blog on basically we tried it, we did our best, let's move on, and I think a lot of people resonated uh, with that. Um, I, I have never played with React Native myself to have a well-informed opinion, but um, yep, Gabe, um, Gabe does. Luckily, paradigms like Swift UI or Jetpack Compose have rekindled the movement to move logic out of our views anyway. So making customization of UI widgets are fairly easy and straightforward as well. So avoiding UI in your multi-platform setup isn't really a big loss. Now let's talk about some language features that you'll have to compromise on. This is uh, pretty fun. Let's say we want to uh, make an enum class in Kotlin. And we look at the generated code and Aside from the fact that New York became the New York, I'm assuming because new is a keyword and it wanted to like, avoid that collision. Um, and so this is how it's generated, fine. Um, you'll see that that city enum um, subclasses from a type called Kotlin enum. And you'll see methods at the bottom that indicate like there's a name and an ordinal. And at reading that, you'll think, oh, OK, it's keeping um, enum values, and they're comparable. This is exactly the behavior I expect for an enum. This is great. Um, right, this is the method I was just talking about. But then when you actually try to consume these uh, enums, you'll automatically be told by uh, Xcode that the switch must be exhaustive. And then you're wondering, wait, what are you, what are you talking about? It, it is exhaustive. I just defined it. Um, but it turns out that that Kotlin enum subclass that it, it inherits from is, is really not an enum at all. It's just a, a type hierarchy from a common base class. And so you've lost exhaustiveness in your enum definition across the bridge. Um, and so, um, yeah, basically aside from the ordinal and compared to functions, uh, that's, that's all you have. Um, so what can we do? Uh, you can just add a default case, thereby just defeating the purpose of an enum altogether. Um, but digging in iOS code, um, I came across this thing called raw representable. Um, and it, it basically provides a way to uh, encode, basically, instead of the enum encoding and decoding the raw value backing for you, you can say, I will take care of encoding and decoding this value. Um, you have the complex logic to do so. And so what if we um, have, we redefine this enum class now on the Swift side um, uh, using this raw representable interface or protocol and then taking as input the raw value of our previously defined enum. And so we're basically creating a bridge enum. Uh, we're taking the, the framework city that is non-exhaustive incorporating it as a raw value. And for the cases where it's unable to define it, we throw a fatal error, which it's essentially like a runtime exception in Java, because um, when you use a raw representable um, subclass, you need to use what's called a failable initializer, which basically means your constructor can return null. Um, and that's unfortunate, because then now you're affecting the call site on instantiating that enum, which defeats the purpose of trying to do this exercise. And so I deliberately wanted to um, avoid that and compile time and defer to runtime, because I know this would be a runtime case that would never happen. And so if you buy that argument, uh, there is a way to basically recapture the semantics of that exhaustiveness. You just have to write this bridge code. Um, and so that's nice. Um, if you are worried about backwards compatibility, say like you change an enum case later, and now you're crashing not because of a case that would never happen, but it's actually a case that does happen because you've just added a fourth case and you forgot to update the bridge code, um, you could get your, give yourself an out with like an additional case that you just special case as unknown. And this will help provide some of that compatibility. Um, and so now you go from this previous case, which made us sad, to something that makes us feel, my animations are off, um, that makes you feel a little more um, like an enum again, because you've regained exhaustiveness. And now um, you might be wondering, like, well, that's kind of annoying. Like, do I have to write all that bridge code myself? And so one of the things that I'm positing is this would be an amazing thing if JetBrains, as part of their suite of, of providing this library or this um, framework, is if they could maybe write a Swift compiler plugin to code gen this for you. I mean, it wouldn't be outside of the norm of things that they're able to do already in their tool chain. Um, and it seems like a pretty uh, small ask. Um, the, the thing there is that they haven't yet really provided any um, Swift 
native support and this would be kind of going down that venture. And I, I don't know what's entailed in that, but I, again, I, I point to the ABI stability as a, a sign that it's worth uh, exploring, at least in something like primitives as important as enums. Okay, so, and so if this is how you would supply the raw value yourself, again, if you were manually bridging it, but again, this should really be cogen for us. All right, so let's move on to another language feature that we really like in Kotlin, the sealed class. And so now we have our enum class city well-defined and we're happy with it. And now we want to create this, um, this sealed class hierarchy of different pizza types. Um, so again, we, we have the same problem. Um, sealed classes act like enums in a sense on the Kotlin end. But we know, we, or at least we can guess, that when they're generated in Objective-C, they're also going to... Um, become just a type hierarchy of classes, and you'd be right to assume so. Um, we also have to add a new case to the city, um, because that's we just added that um, for the dessert pizza, in case you missed it. And then um, in Swift, there's uh, Swift is a very interesting language, is because it doesn't just provide, it, it's, it has the most flexible enum system I've ever encountered, in that you don't, it's not just automatically backed by integers. You can tell it like what primitive to actually back it. You can use a raw representable if you want to take care of it yourself. Or you can even use something called um, enums with associated values where certain cases of your enum could almost have a second dimension of value. And it's something I haven't really seen in other programming languages and so maybe like, like F sharp or something. Um, but um, taking that paradigm that we worked on earlier, it's a little messier because now in order to keep this exhaustiveness feeling, we will have to do things like typecast because the enums that have associated values can no longer be uh, checked using your regular case statements. Um, but again, if you're, because this is code gen, who cares? Like, if you're writing this, it sucks. If something's generated for you, it doesn't suck as much because you'll never look at it. And then you can, uh, again, achieve this feeling of a sealed class in Swift world using associated values and, and, and go on with having this native feel. And so to test this, I, I wrote some test code and sure enough, it prints what exactly I think it should, which is great. Um, it really would be great if um, JetBrains could incorporate this. Of course, enums aren't all uh, you know, what they're cracked up to be, Kotlin native. Um, does encounter some problems. I think this was, yeah, Kevin um, Galligan from TouchLab filed this. I encountered this the other day. I think there was a memory leak if you access an enum off the main thread and, because why wouldn't you? They're enums. Um, but um, and I don't know the state of that bug. But again, just keep in mind that while multi-platform is heavily being adopted, that there's still some things to shake out. I'm going to quickly go over generics because that's always a fun topic. But um, it's important to know that the state of generics is also one of those things that isn't uh, fully well defined. Um, and the disclaimer here is I probably pretty much got most of this content from Kevin because he knows this a lot better than I do. Um, and so we make this state holder class that just takes in a generic uh, type. And um, you can see it here. It just saves the value and then has a getter to pull that state out. Um, and when the Swift world, we want to consume this. Um, and the Swift, the Xcode will immediately tell us uh, that it can't be coerced um, to this any type. And you're like, huh? What, what are you talking about? Um, I didn't declare this as a T question mark. I declared this as a T. Why would you say that? And so if you look at the equivalent uh, Objective C code, you'll see that there's these nullable um, markers um, placed within the code. And um, the reason for this is just the way how the two languages work. So Kotlin and Swift will define nullability on the types themselves, right? You have like any and any question mark. But in Objective-C, the nullability, I, I didn't know this, that nullability is defined on the properties and the methods themselves. It's almost like your, your entry and exit points are where you define the nullability, but the type itself isn't. And Kotlin and Swift take a very different approach. But here we are bridging between two languages that don't speak the same thing. And so... The TLDR there is, um, Kevin wrote a blog post that said, like, that discovered that if you have an unbounded generic parameter, um, you will always hit this case. And what does that mean? It means that you will have to, did I just 
show the same thing again. Oh, to fix it, you'll have to update the generic parameter to have an upper bound to, of any. And it seems silly, right? Because you didn't really change any semantics there. You said you went from being a T raw type to like a T that is bounded by any, which is going to be all the types anyway. So, but it's it's a, it's a nice little hack. It's it's nice that just doing that will solve the problem. Uh, because now your error goes away, and if you look back in your Objective-C header, the nullables went away as well. Um, in general, Kotlin has the most flexibility when it comes to generics variants. Um, it supports both declaration site variants and use site variants via type in projections. Um, Objective-C, on the other hand, only supports uh, declaration site variants, um, and I honestly forgot what Swift supports. Um, but the TLDR there is, read this blog. Kevin wrote a lot about it. Um, it's not great. Um, there are a lot of workarounds to it. And if you really want to hear the pains he's had to go through, I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you. Um, and ma mainly because he implemented the interop for generics on the Kotlin native repo. So again, chat with him. Value types. This is an interesting thing. So value types in... Um, in uh, Swift, or fun, um, or types in Swift in general fall into these two categories. We'll talk about the value types first. It's essentially, if you're familiar with like C, um, the idea of structs or unions, those are all value types. Otherwise, you can just point to um, your primitive types in Java, like your ints, your cars, where they're all uh, call by value. You, you copy the actual memory to the argument when you're calling the function. Um, and um, but in Swift, a lot more things are value types than you may be used to as a JVM programmer. Um, structs and enums, sure, but in primitives, sure. But even base collections like arrays and sets and dictionaries, which is the analog to the hash map on the JVM, those are also value types, and so are strings. And so um, there are huge benefits for this because, um, for example, um, let's say we have this test class with an address, and I... I have almost the same address as my neighbor except for our apartment number and I just change it. Like a Java developer would look at this and I'm like, you just modified the state of both things, but aha, no, it's a struct, so you didn't. And printing it out verifies that. Um, as opposed to if you were using a class type, a reference type, where you, you're, what you're passing to the function is a reference, not the actual the, it, the contiguous memory location representing the entire person. It's just a pointer to a person. Um, now you are sharing a single copy, and so you do run the risk of it, it, um, unless, um, uh, what it is, what am I trying to say? You basically you run the risk of modifying data unintentionally, which is a huge source of bugs. Um, and so in this case, I accidentally changed the first name. Um, so, but value types are really popular in Swift, and you get this unique copied instance. It provides immutability, which is particularly handy when you're dealing in multi-threaded environments. In Kotlin, we, we do it differently. We, we, we do like immutability, right? We don't like bugs, but we, we instead of doing it from a value type perspective, we leverage the power of data classes. Um, and the, the reason there is because historically to that, we had Java builders, right? Where we could basically piecemeal construct an object and then lock it in with immutable fields. Um, but that was very verbose um, because Java. Data class had this nice compromise where you could, as long as you made all your properties vals, um, you could then keep them all immutable. And when you want, you get this nice little utility called copy that allows you to just mutate the subset of the properties that you want on assignment, as opposed to the builder pattern, which like separated your immutability state from your object creation state in this verbose way. Um, one. Con, not really, but it, it's just, it surprised me anyway until I really thought about it more, is that if, for, if you want to mutate a struct, both the object, the, both the, the handle, the, the, the marker to the struct and the member must be mutable. Um, again, thinking from Java world where I can have a constant reference to my object, but a like, mutable field, that should be enough. Um, but because the struct is literally the contiguous block of memory of all the fields together. Um, it's not like you're going to offset into a memory location as like in C pointer arithmetic style. Um, and so if, when I thought of it that way, it made sense to me why, it, yeah, if you, if you want to mutate it, you have to have everything uh, be var. Um, they're pure data, and they're not objects, and therefore having features like properties or encapsulation through mod access modifiers are just not a thing. Um, but what if we had something where in Kotlin, 
where we could have, instead of a reference type point, um, we could have something like a value class in Kotlin that would achieve the semantics that I outlined earlier. And so if you looked at an array of these points, um, this is what it would look like in a sense in memory. Um, each object in the JVM contains a header file that describes a class metadata and takes, uh, I think, 8 bits on 32-bit systems and 16 bits on 64-bit systems. It basically scales with the architecture. Um, but then we'll have references. Every element in that array will have a reference to its respective element, which also will have a header because it's also a class. Um, but if these were represented as value classes, then maybe it could be something like this, where you could use the, the pointer arithmetic model. And all of a sudden, now you don't have to worry about mutating your array accidentally because it's all copy on write. Um, there is no value type system based. In, so what the, the point? The point that I should be saying is that, um, yes, this is nice, and yes, we want this, but Kotlin can't provide this for us, per se, because Kotlin, um, more or less, has, it has a great tool chain, but it's really syntactic sugar based on JVM bytecode, and so like the JVM has to have this built into it innately. Um, and there isn't anything at the moment aside from the built-in primitives. Um, however, there has been an ongoing effort, I want to say for like a decade, to try to provide this support. And it's not an easy problem, and people are working on it um, as part of a project called Valhalla. Um, and there was a recent um, L World release in July um, that allowed people to start experimenting with a version of the JDK that does provide this value type semantic. Um, but it's early access, so who knows when it'll be stable. So I, I wouldn't hold my breath, but it's promising because if this does land in the JVM bytecode, then Kotlin could conceivably pick this up, and then you could get better interop from Kotlin and Swift World. And so there are trickle-down effects by having this innately built into the JVM. Let's talk a little bit about build performance. Um, so we're all, we're, in this example that I pointed to earlier, we're building all the source sets. Um, and we're doing it using a Gradle command. And so we can look at the Gradle task. And um, in, a, in a talk I gave in the past, I showed some like quick snippet on how you can print a graph of your Gradle tasks. And so what's really interesting is just to see what tasks are dedicated to iOS builds. And it turns out there are not many. Um, you have to uh, basically compile the iOS code and then link it to the framework and then copy it over for Xcode. And that's pretty much it. Cool. So. That's cool, three extra tasks. What's their, their build impact? Um, and so if you run this profile command, um, typical Gradle profile command, you'll see that 60% uh, or so of the time in my trivial sample project, your mileage may vary, um, was spent on linking the d debug framework. Um, and I'm not r really too good in the weeds of iOS, like frameworks to know what linking involves other than like from a C static library linking level, but that just seems like a long time in general. So 18 seconds to compile a few methods and link it to a framework. And um, yeah, that just seems like a long time. So maybe I have something misconfigured, but I, that's definitely a, an alarming thing for a Hello World project. Um, Another thing is just something that's broken with Kotlin in general with Gradle. Um, there was a, a bug that I filed a, a couple of weeks back where if you switch branches pretty much and you use build caching in Gradle, you will always be broken. You will lose incremental compilation because of something innate to the Kotlin plugin. And um, you may wonder, how am I so sure that it's the Kotlin plugin? Is because I filed this issue with both Gradle and um, Kotlin, and Gradle closed it within a, like a few hours saying, nope. It's Kotlin's fault. And in particular, it's because um, there's one task, the, the, the abstract task for all Kotlin compilation, whether it's capped, whether it's native, whether it's just JVM compilation, all um, the, the input for that task points uh, to a file path, an absolute file path. And when it's trying to cache your build results, it shouldn't be absolute, because if you're using, say, a remote build cache, the file path of your computer's build is not going to be the same as your colleague's build. And once you start using absolute file paths, all like semantics of Gradle build caching goes out the window. And so um, it's, it's a bug. Um, it has been triaged. Um, and that is the bit.ly link if you're curious. And if you want to even dig in deeper, that's the line of code that's the problem. Um, <laughs> I haven't had time to really try to roll up my sleeves and look at it, but I, I did a grep for the annotation that the Gradle person 
um, suggested was the problem. And there's only one instance. So this literally is the line that's the problem. Um, it's not just a matter of deleting the annotation. You actually have to fix the problem, which is why it's not like that trivial. But um, if it's solvable, you'll get a lot of kudos from the Kotlin community. Uh, let's talk about runtime performance. So this is interesting because as you start to use this, you're going to start to notice build times. And so um, as your build times degrade or otherwise, you, you want to like dig in. And so I wanted to start seeing, like I wrote a merge sort. I wrote it three times. I wrote it in with Kotlin multi-platform. I wrote it in Swift, which is interesting because apparently if you sub array an array, you don't get an array. You get an array slice, and they don't have a common subtype. So now your recursive function breaks and all these fun things. Um, and when you sublist a list in Kotlin, the, they both use the common list interface type. And um, it's just the implementation that's different. Sublisting a list will actually not copy the list over. It'll just smartly point to the two indices for this, the, denoting the range of the original backed list, and which is what array slices does in, in, in Swift. But it does it as value types. And so there is no type hierarchy with that. And so, um, yeah, recursion, recursive functions just become a little more painful. Or maybe I just have to learn how to do it better in Swift. Um, because I didn't know that's how Swift works, I wind up actually doing extra copies in my Swift version of this. And that's a key point, because I want to call out the fact that my Swift implementation is a little less optimal. Um, but by running this three different times, and we plot this, we see that even with that suboptimally written Swift code, the Kotlin, the Kotlin implementation, the multi-platform implementation, takes on average twice as long to run as the native Swift implementation. Um, again, this is merge sort. You're not usually running merge sort in your apps day to day. But just think of things that are heavily computing. Um, now you have a hot code path using multi-platform functions. This is something to think about. Um, the vertical axis is in milliseconds. Um, and for mobile applications, which is what I tend to you know, write more of lately, um, this, depending, I mean, I'm, I'm merge sorting 5,000 elements. Once you, if you're like in the 500 to 1,000 element, you're probably like in, uh, taking four milliseconds, which isn't going to drop a frame on a mobile platform. But it's something to think about. Um, another thing to notice is like the bump that happens at various points, and that's probably because um, in Kotlin Native, you're integrating with the Objective-C Swift world in terms of garbage collection. It uses reference counting, and the unused Kotlin objects are automatically removed, but I don't know um, how quickly they are removed. I don't know if it's like at on-demand once the references are automatically deleted, or if it's like done at some time in the future. I honestly don't know. When you then compare uh, to the rest of it, you, it's not surprising that the, uh, the Android running of the multi-platform code is more or less what native Kotlin on, or you know, canonical Kotlin on Android would run as. It's much faster. And you can see that if you graph it. They're pretty much equal. Um, so that's encouraging. There is no worse performance for Android to consume the multi-platform library than is if it weren't a multi-platform library as the TLDR there. Still, despite saying that the Kotlin native runtime is slower on iOS, um, Andre did mention during the keynote that they are doubling down on making this more performant for uh, their upcoming, I guess, 1.3 release. Um, or if this has been released, TLDR, they're working on it. Um, for another case study of performance, again, referring to Ben and Alex's talk um, yesterday, um, I ran it on a SQL Delight. Um, so I mentioned that SQL Delight is a wrapper uh, to consume, like to make, you know, basically your, I don't want to call it an ORM because it's not, but it allows you to interface with a database pretty simply um, by just using raw SQL and it'll generate all the mapping functions for you. And so it's multi platform, and so we have a portion in our app which runs, um, that searches across our database uh, for all like peer to peer transactions or Bitcoin trades and using this functionality. And so what's interesting is, um, this is how you set up in the framework. Um, I searched in my activity for some random guy on the internet and looked at it on both clients and saw like, uh, what would be the performance if I'm typing his name character by character? Um, and here are the results for, um, in terms of milliseconds. You see that the Colin Android search gets a little weird for some reason. Maybe it's the way that we're parsing text differently from iOS. That might be something to look into. Um, but the thing to point out is, um, and, and Ben and Alec mentioned this yesterday as well, is that on, on Cash App, we're currently using this weird JavaScript bridge that we were desperately trying to get rid of. Um, but it turns out that the, so the Kotlin is slightly better, but not 
too much better than the JavaScript bridge currently is, but it's also not worse. Um, so it's beneficial for us to like in, uh, explore using more multi-platform in our app because again, we're not doing merge sort here. We're just typing a few characters um, and conducting a database query. So that's interesting. Um, another thing, Wire 3 uh, talked at uh, Igor and Benoit from our team gave in New York about uh, protobufs and providing uh, gRPC functionality in Kotlin. Um, the reason why I mentioned this, and that's the link to the talk if you want to watch it, is um, we're, we're really happy in the past year of converting and modularizing our Android protos from Java to Kotlin. Um, and our colleagues on iOS world are still working with Proto C and the build tool chains that, in, that go along with that. And, and they, they're desperately trying to um, enjoy this lifestyle that we have on Android using this wire tool. And so um, over the next year, we're looking to see how we can help like, work with them to get them on this, um, on this, this um, wire platform. And so there are multiple approaches that we can take. We can either take Kotlin native approach and have them consume like the Objective-C header style, um, or we can maybe code gen Swift wrappers to interact with this Objective-C header seamlessly. Because again, like having the benefits of enums and value objects from a Swift consump the, the call sites, is, it would be nice, especially because protos are a very core part of using uh, interaction in your app. Um, my point here is that basically uh, wire, the way that it works is um, you have this proto message and then there's this adapter that, by which you encode and decode um, to serialize or deserialize your proto message as a bunch of bytes that you just sent over the wire. And so there is a runtime associated with that is already multi-platform. And so if you have a runtime underneath that is multi-platform, um, if you just apply a layer over it that can help um, be, be consumed by iOS apps, then you, you basically have most of the work done already, quote unquote. Okay, so let's recap. We covered a lot of disparate topics. Um, so first of all, with, um, for like effective Kotlin Swift interop, just beware of like int itself because of its platform, um, its architecture dependency there. Um, prefer to use like int32 or 64 if you aren't sure, just like stick to long. Um, beware of method overloads with similar parameter names or just be very mindful of your naming in general because um, what you consume on Swift is still, uh, while you're, what you're consuming on Swift would be nice and, uh, um, will be nice and, and, and easy to um, consume, the Objective-C header may be a little more um, gnarly, um, as you saw with the underscore example. Let's continue to grow the core suite of libraries because um, the community just benefits overall and we can move uh, faster. Uh, enums matter. It's a currently source spot in our today's interop story. Um, however, I provided some um, recipes that maybe we can uh, dig into. For example, if JetBrains could provide some code gen so that we get that nice uh, Swift experience when consuming the enum. Uh, on the other hand, from the generic side of things, um, favoring more Swift isn't necessarily a great thing because generics seem to be, work better with Objective-C. So uh, maybe don't code gen generics, but code gen enums and have a fair compromise. Um, no matter what progress is made, you still won't have value types until Project Valhalla falls on the JVM, and so there's that to think about. There's like multiple concerns. Um, build performance could be better, but we're looking forward to some of the native compiler stuff. I, I, I wasn't discouraged by anything but merge sorts, so unless you're doing really heavy like ML or computation, um, I wouldn't, you know, I maybe wouldn't work with a multi-platform library in that respect, but um, most other use cases are fine. Um, the build cache issue is affecting all of us, even if we're not using multi-platform today, so we should just fix that. Um, runtime performance wasn't too bad, but as I mentioned, heavy computation does pay a higher price, and the future continues to look promising, and we're hoping to have wire support on iOS for uh, the coming year. And that is it. Um, I'll be sticking around for questions afterwards if you'd like to, to chat. Otherwise, thanks uh, for attending the talk. And remember to vote. <laughs> <laughs>